Well, good morning. I'm really excited to be here. Pastor Deborah and I have been hoping to do this for about two years, and this is the first time we've actually been able to pull it off. Uh, although this is the first time I've been at the First Baptist Church of Needham, I'm well acquainted with your church, both through your previous pastor and also through Pastor Deborah. And I've known Pastor Deborah for a number of years. In fact, I was on her ordination council at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Malden a number of years ago, uh, where I first became acquainted with her. Uh, so I'm really delighted to be here. And I thought I'd take just a couple of minutes to share with you a little bit about my own church, the West Medford Baptist Church in Medford, Massachusetts. When I went there in 1996, there were only eight people left. And they were talking about closing and probably would have closed. Fortunately, I was working full-time for a hospital at the time, uh, also pastoring or had been pastoring. And so uh, I talked with them and said, I'd be happy to come and be their pastor on two conditions. Number one, we pray about everything before we do anything. And once we have some inclination of what God wants us to do, we'll do it no matter what. We won't say we tried that and it didn't work. We won't say we don't have it, enough money to do that. We'll just go ahead and do it. Seventeen years later, we have 70 to 90 people on Sunday morning. We rehab the building. We put in a $100,000 kitchen. We air condition the sanctuary. Uh, last Sunday, we baptized five teenagers. And we are having a wonderful time. And my other message to you this morning, in addition to the sermon, is that you can do anything with God's help if you believe you can do it. I once received a telephone call from a parishioner who asked me, what do I believe? I thought I had misunderstood her. What do you mean, I asked. I mean, she said, what do I believe? You see, I've just come from a party where several people got into a discussion about their various beliefs. One woman was Jewish, and she told us what she believes as a Jew. Another was Roman Catholic, and she told us what Catholics believe. Somebody else was a Christian scientist, and he talked about what they believe. And I was the only Protestant in the group, and frankly, I didn't know what to say. What do I believe? Well, that woman must have come into the church by confusion of faith <laughs> rather than confession of faith. But unfortunately, you know, there are a lot of people today who are suffering from confusion of faith, and they can't say exactly what it is that they believe. But you know, it's very easy to sympathize with people like that. In a world as confused and heterogeneous as ours, it may, is no wonder that many people can feel lost and bewildered. Many things have happened in the present century to shake anyone's easy confidence in what most believers at one time took for granted. Two world wars, several major conflicts, great suffering that accompanied them, all of these things have played a part in eroding people's faith. Albert Camus, the Nobel Prize winning novelist, once said that he could not believe in a God who permitted the destruction and unhappiness of millions of people, including innocent women and children. In one of Ernest Hemingway's novels, A Farewell to Arms, someone asked Lieutenant Henry, who was wounded in the First World War, if he was croyant. Criant means, are you a believer? And his response was, only at night. In the daytime, when my mind is alert, I can no longer believe. But at night, some of those old yearnings return. The age of science and technology has made it increasingly hard to think in terms of religious causality. Many people are inoculated with just enough understanding of the laws of physics to blind them to the great mysteries of the universe. They take kind of a laboratory approach to life. 
and because they cannot quantify or qualify the role of the creator, they assume that the deity was only a god of the gaps, imagined by primitive people to explain the natural phenomenon for which they had no scientific explanations. Some of the recent advances in medicine and communications, among others, have only further removed us from a sense of the presence of God among us and within us. Wonder drugs and organ transplants have given many people undue confidence that many physicians themselves will readily admit is misplaced. And the development of the, of the media, especially television and the internet, has provided humanity with such a vivid world of instantaneous diversion that many people now go through life with ever, uh, without ever confronting the void surrounding their consciousness. They simply turn on the tube or put in some earphones or sit in front of the screen and propel themselves into a vicarious world where they can escape the necessity of existential decision making. Who needs God, man? Ask one twisting, gyrating young man with an iPod in his hand and earphones in his ears. And he said, this is it, man, this is it. The geometrical increase of knowledge in our time with its relativism that invariably accompanies it has also had a destructive influence on the whole area of faith. Everything in the mind is in rat's country, says anthropologist Lauren Isley. It never dies. He means that we are kind of like pack rats, especially now that we have computers. We never destroy any information anymore. It's all right there for us. As a consequence, we are overwhelmed by data banks, by stored experiences, by all that there is to see and all that there is to hear and all that there is to know. In a world filled with so much information, people don't know what to believe anymore. The Hindus in India have one belief system. The natives in Zimbabwe have another. One religion teaches renunciation, the renunciation of the world. Get as far away from the world as you can. And another embra uh, advocates embracing the world and taking the world in. What should a person believe? It is no wonder that professors of religion in colleges and universities are often respectful of all beliefs while they have none of their own. God used to rage at the Israelites for frequenting the sacred groves, says Annie Dillard in her little book, Teaching a Stone to Talk. She says, I wish I could find one. I wish I could find one of those stones. Her point is that we have so relativized the world that we have ended by desacralizing it, by removing every hint of transcendence, pantheism, the idea that everything is inhabited by a god, that has given way to panatheism, which is the idea that everything is holy. And if everything is holy, then nothing is holy. Confusion of faith indeed. We admire the great modern heroes of the Christian way, such as Albert Schweitzer and Mother Teresa, but we don't pretend to understand how they can be so single-minded. We are personally much more in tune with Woody Allen, who says in Love and Death, if God would only speak to me, even just once, if he would only cough, if I could just see a miracle, if I could just see a burning bush, or if I could just see the seas part, or if I could just see Uncle Sasha pick up the check at dinner. What happens when we no longer believe anything and can't act from a center of spiritual certainty the way our forebearers obviously did? Well, we tend to lose our sense of direction. We're like globules of mercury racing this way and that with nothing to steady us and nothing to guide us. 
I once heard a very convincing explanation of this from a completely non-religious source, a merchant of self-confidence whose name was Shad Hemsletter. What he asked is the most basic thing that can be described about a person. Think about that. What is the most basic thing that can be described about a person? He said it's the person's behavior. Whatever else can be said about any person, the behavior remains the most obvious thing about them, what you see them doing. But what determines behavior? It's your feelings. The person behaves the way he or she does because of the way they feel. What controls a person's feelings? Their attitudes. If the person has an optimistic attitude, he or she will feel upbeat and happy. If they have a pessimistic attitude, on the other hand, they will feel negative and unhappy. But you know, there's something else that lies behind our attitudes, and that's our beliefs. What people believe controls what their attitudes are going to be. If they believe there is a God and that that God is working for their good, their attitudes will be more positive than if they believe everything is mechanistic and there is no moral center of life. If we do not know what we believe, in other words, if our belief centers have simply collapsed from the pressures of suffering or scientific preoccupation or intellectual relativism, then we have nothing which, which to control our attitudes and our feelings and ultimately our behavior. Our human consciousness will just kind of drift without a rudder on a vast sea of meaninglessness. We are what we believe. You've heard it said we are what we eat, and that's true too. But we are what we believe. Hem's letter's explanation goes one step further. He says, behind behavior and feelings and attitudes and beliefs, there is an even more basic determinant in our lives. Anybody care to guess what that might be? Programming. We are being programmed every day. The human mind, he said, is like a computer, and it will behave in the way that it is programmed. It acts out the information that is fed into it. It is what we are programmed to think that determines what we believe, and in turn what our attitudes are, and so on and so on. Two famous sociologists, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, have given a name to this kind of programming that we all are subject to. They call it the social construction of reality. In a book by that very same name, they demonstrate the manner in which all human beings tend to receive their understanding of what is real and what is valuable in life from other human beings, especially those in greatest proximity to themselves, instead of from their own independent experimentation and perception. We let others program us into what we are rather than programming ourselves. If our society believes in God, we shall probably believe in God. If the society is not particularly interested in God, then we are not likely to be very much committed to thoughts of God either. So given a society like ours, which is more and more disinclined to believe in God, which is admittedly only nominally religious and given more and more to secular and hedonistic inclinations, our pro programming for belief is at best rather indefinite, and we are more likely to emulate such idols as Cher, Madonna, Michael Jackson, Sylvester Stallone, Lee Iacocca, and Donald Trump than we are St. Francis or Mother Teresa. These are the personages who are programming our belief system today. But fortunately, belief sometimes manifests itself in a way that goes against our programming. That's what happened in the case of Saul of Tarsus. You remember him. 
the highly trained Pharisee who claimed to have had a remarkable encounter with a resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus and went on to become the hyper-energetic 13th apostle. It was also true in the case of Ignatius Loyola, a soldier reared to battle in courtly love under the secretary of the Spanish treasury. Lying in bed with a wounded leg, he asked for a certain book to read. His attendants could not find it, so they brought him another book, a little book called The Flower of the Saints. And when he had finished reading that little book, there was a visible change in his manner. Laying aside knighthood, he became an ardent follower of Jesus Christ. And eventually, he founded the influential Society of Jesus, or as we know them today, the Jesuits. Belief asserted itself against programming in the case of Sasha Makovkin. And I'm going to end my remarks today with his story, because it's a very, very remarkable story. Sasha Makovkin, a gifted potter in Russia. Sasha's uncle was the dean of St. Basil's Russian Orthodox Church, that great landmark in Red Square in Moscow that you've all seen on the television. During the revolution that created the Soviet state, the soldiers carried all of the icons from the church and threw them on the pavement out in front of the church. And then they offered the dean a bargain. They said if he would walk on those icons and denounce his Lord Jesus, they would forgive him and let him live. But if he would not, they would shoot him. And for many years, Sasha did not understand why his uncle refused and died for his belief. Why would anyone hold their belief higher than their life? Sasha, of course, belonged to a new era. He belonged to a new kind of programming. He came with his family to the United States and reached manhood during the heady days of the Vietnam conflict when young people were tuning in and dropping out, when smoking pot and avoiding the draft became a way of life. Protesting the war and joining the way of jeans and sandals, he discovered his talent and he became a potter. He and the woman he lived with built a rude house entirely of castaway materials in the woods above the hippie center of Mendocino, California. Then, while leading a pottery workshop for a local Presbyterian church, Sasha began to read the Gospel of John. Over and over and over, he felt confronted by the challenge to believe in Jesus Christ. In passages like this, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me will have eternal life. If you believe Moses, you would believe me as well, for I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. More than 80 times, 80 times, says Sasha, more than 80 times, the Bible says we must believe. 80 times. I could not get away from its insistence, he said. So at last I had no choice but to surrender to Christ. At last, too, Sasha understood about his uncle. There are some beliefs that shape one's attitude so completely that one will even die for them. Sasha's own attitudes began to change, and so did his feelings, and so did his behavior. He began to witness to the strange power that had come into his life and to the wonderful happiness that it brought to him. As he gave pottery workshops, which he was doing with increasing frequency, he talked about the greatest potter of all, the one who shapes our lives into things of beauty and things of durability. And now, years later, he talks of little else. 
Everywhere he speaks of the power of belief to change human life. His own beautiful life is his greatest witness to that fact. There is no confusion of faith in Sasha. In a world of suffering and scientific attitudes and intellectual relativism, he goes quietly and confidently on his way, for he knows what he believes. More importantly, he knows whom he believes, for the faith he has found is a very deeply personal faith, one in which he believes God has addressed him and he has answered with the commitment of his life in every and any way that he can. Sasha's programming did not prepare him for this. Like Tertullian of old, he believes in spite of the evidence, in spite of the way that our society has chosen to construct its view of reality, his belief has triumphed over his programming, and he is an example of what it means to live with the certainty of faith in an age of secularism. You know, it's our responsibility as a Christian community to offer to people alternative programming to that that our culture offers to them. And so I encourage you, stick to our main purpose. Help people become people of faith. Amen.